right. Uh, so today we have another special guest. It's quite a week with special guests. Uh, our seventh of the week, uh, Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Cecilia Rouse, a member of the President's Families Cabinet. This is not her first time in the briefing room, but as a quick introduction, uh, the, uh, she is a renowned labor economist who recently served as Dean of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. She previously served as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama-Biden administration, I had the pleasure of working with her, and on the National Economic Council in the Clinton administration. Uh, she's the first African American and just the fourth woman to lead the CEA in the 74 years of its existence. She has a very busy day, as we all do, a lot going on here, uh, but she'll take just a couple of questions when she wraps up. And I'm so happy I don't have to put my mask back on. Okay, come on over. Great, thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, so this past year we've been living through a once in 100 years pandemic, or at least that's what we certainly hope. Uh, the speed with which we powered down the economy was unprecedented. And while we have suffered and lost much over the past year, the efficiency and speed with which we have rolled out the vaccinations, even surpa surpassing President Biden's own initial and I might say ambitious goals, has meant that the United States has made tremendous pro progress at curbing the virus. As a result, we are in the midst of restarting this economy in earnest. And we are making good progress in doing so. However, we must keep in mind that an economy will not heal instantaneously. It takes several weeks for people to get full immunity from vaccinations and even more time for those left jobless from the pandemic to find and start a suitable job. Supply trains have been disrupted and sectors that were hardest hit are just beginning to come back. I will also note that given the extraordinary and unprecedented circumstances of the pandemic, it will remain difficult for analysts to accurately forecast economic data until we have more fully recovered. For example, in just one day, we now anticipate an oversupply of masks and an undersupply of lipstick. I don't know about you guys, but I, that's what I thought of this morning. In all seriousness, different sectors of the economy will come back online at different times and at different, place, at different paces. And while the actual economy will likely change from week to week, reported data will lag the process. As a result, as the economy recovers, there will be data that come in below expectations and the data that will come in above expectations. We saw that this week with the CPI and last week with the jobs report. Today's report on retail sales in April came in softer than most expected after a large increase last month. At moments like this, it is important to focus on trends and not month to month or week to week oscillations. In that vein, we know that the initial estimate for first quarter GDP was 6.4%, outpacing growth in the Eurozone, and employment has grown an average of 500,000 jobs per month since January. Even while the overall trend in the economy is positive, the administration is working to help displace workers with their searches so that they can find good, suitable work. And as the President emphasized earlier this week, if offered a suitable job, a worker receiving unemployment benefits must take it. We're also emphasizing to employers that there are resources to help them hire workers part-time without those workers losing their unemployment benefits through short-time compensation. And we're reminding employers of the extension of the employee retention tax credit in the American Rescue Plan. While it is important we continue to support workers, families, and businesses until the virus is more robustly contained, we also recognize the imperative of supporting the healing of our labor market. In the meantime, we know that the mismatch between different parts of the economy will show up in unexpected ways until the economy more fully recovers. As such, the president, as the President urged earlier this week, we must be patient. At the same time, we cannot forget that the longer term structural problems our economy faces as well. The, economic, the Council of Economic Advisors released an issue brief just yesterday on the economic framework underlying the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. Addressing these structural issues is so important to ensuring a strong economic future for our country, and that's why I'm so incredibly proud, proud to be a member of the American Families Plan Cabinet, which was the original reason for me to be here today. And so I am now happy to take a few questions. Nancy, kick us off. Thank you so much, Cecilia. I know I hear what you're saying about the fact that the economic numbers are going to be kind of unpredictable right now, but what did you make of the jump in consumer prices last month, the largest hike since 2008? Um, yes, I mean, that's, an, uh, that's obviously an important question, and uh, it was interesting to me that even the Federal Reserve was a bit surprised by the jump. So we hadn't forecasted that. The forecasters hadn't expected that. 
But if you dig below the surface, what you see is, for example, 30% of that increase was in the used car sales market. And we know that there are supply, issue, supply chain issues there with the semiconductors. And if you think about getting back and healing markets, we know that rental car companies are buying, they have to replenish their stocks because they liquidated their, their stocks last year when people were not renting cars. Um, we know that because of the American Rescue Plan, people were buying cars because many people were afraid of taking public transit, which is not good either. Um, but taking, instead of taking public transit, they wanted to buy more new cars. But with the shortage in the semiconductor supply chain, uh, the supply just wasn't meeting demand. So that's where a big part of the jump was. Another part was in those sectors that were really hit by the virus. Uh, we saw some of them are starting to come back. The most vivid example that we found was in the airline industry. Uh, where we saw a 10% increase in their prices in, in, month to month. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I know lots of, okay, I'm working here, so I don't get time to do this. But other people I know are looking forward to taking time off this summer, and they're buying, air, they're buying airplane tickets. So there was a 20% increase in airline tickets, but it's still uh, a 10% increase in airline tickets, but it's still 20% below where it was uh, before the pandemic. So those prices are increasing because we were at unusual lows because of the pandemic. They are rebounding as the economy starts to heal. But many of those sectors are actually not even back to where they were before. So we expect there's going to be a period as you know, supply starts equal demand and sectors are, are healing and recovering that we're going to see some, you know, there's going to be some choppiness. But even if that's the case, at what point does concern about inflation become its own economic problem? So, Look, I, you know, this is really the purview of the Federal Reserve, and, and, you know, we try to maintain their independence. But what economists worry about is when inflation becomes de-anchored. And so at the moment, it looks as though people fully expect this inflation to be uh, te uh, temporary, where temporary is when the economy more fully recovers. Um, but that we understand that there are not sort of structural factors that should lead to inflation that the, that the Federal Reserve cannot control. I mean, I was wondering if I could follow on that a little bit. There seems to be this assumption that we've heard from people within the administration that this inflation is temporary, that it'll, we'll get through the choppiness by the end of the year. And I'm wondering what you're seeing in the data that, that suggests that's true. Is it just sort of hopeful um, guesses based on coming out of the pandemic? Or are you actually seeing something that doesn't lead to that worst case scenario? So as I just gave an example, much of the increase last month was in airline prices. So airline prices ticked up because they had completely cratered last time, last year this time. Uh, so they, you know, there's been a robust increase month to month, but they are still not even close to where they were this time last year. So clearly the airline industry is recovering. I do not expect those prices to continue, you know, continue past where they were last year. Um, because at some point people will stop, you know, I don't think people take multiple vacations, uh, but I think many people have been cooped up in their houses and they would like to travel. And so we're seeing, you know, increased demand uh, in the airline industry. So, you know, let's take the, car, the auto sector, which accounted for a third of that increase. Again, I expect that to be one time. So there's going to be this kind of misalignment and, you know, as the, that's what happens in, in economics. Prices are signals, right? They signal when something is in short supply, when something's in oversupply, and I fully expect that that will work itself out in the coming months. Right. I mean, Michigan's consumer sentiment survey came out today, it was much lower than expected, which indicates that people might be fearful that this is a, a trend beyond just, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, we're all buying plane tickets for the first time, or there's one sector of the economy. So. I guess I'm. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious. Are you really just chalking it up to these initial stumbles, or do you believe that there's this? this problem? So this was an unprecedented economic downturn. I don't know about your lifetimes. I think I may be older than most of you. Um, so, like, we have not had. Um, first of all, the pandemic, so where we completely powered down the economy, and therefore we've never had a recession that was not tied to a problem in the economy but that was tied to a health problem. And so there's even uncertainty about the recovery because our recovery is hitched to the, to the virus. We are making fabulous progress in this country in terms of controlling the virus. But I'd like to remind you that only 58% of adults have had one shot, at least one shot. But if we actually drill down, if we're gonna take the example of the labor market, uh, only a quarter of those who are aged 18 to 29 are fully vaccinated and only a third of those aged 30 to 39 are fully vaccinated. 
we are just not to the other side of this yet. So, I, you know, obviously, you know, I we sincerely don't want to see our economy end up in a hyperinflation of some kind. But it is just too early to be drawing that conclusion when we consider the depth and the nature of this economic recession. We are still 8 million jobs down from where we were this time last year. Uh, we have a long way to go. Trevor? Um, so you, you, you talked about these areas where there's these little pockets of supply de demand uh, mismatch in the economy. You know, there's, uh, I think others have talked about lumber and just kind of random areas within the economy. Um, have you done any analysis of whether um, tariff reduction would be um, helpful in some of those areas? Well, so, you know, our, our, our international trade policy is part of a longer term, uh, you know, is part of the longer term economic plan. And I know that our trade representatives are looking at all of those factors. But let's, like, let's face it, the pandemic, we all hope to be on the other side of the pandemic. You know, next year there may be some tailwinds, you know, just because, again, this was unprecedented. Trade policy is a much bigger issue, and that needs to be worked out in the context of our global partners um, and as part of having a really well-running and efficient global economy. And, and does inflation create um, a bit more of an argument for deficit reduction as you go forward and start looking at, at kind of your budget planning and whether there needs to be um, a change in, in how, the, how, much, how much debt uh, the government is taking on as it spends into the economy? Right. So, so the, the, you know, the, the expenditures over the past year because of the pandemic, uh, most recently with the American Rescue Plan, we're all deficit finance, and because we were in a, a you know a complete emergency, um, and so and it was the right thing to do. It was the right way for us to get the economy back on track. Let's remember that our ability to to deal with the debt is not just a factor of the level of debt, but it has to do with the size of the economy. In order to keep the denominator, the size of the economy, larger, we needed to be supporting families and businesses and other and keeping that activity going to the extent it could. Um, the American Jobs Plan and the American Rescue Plan. The president, you know, are longer-term investments. They are designed to be paid out over eight to ten years, and the president has put on the table ways to raise revenue to pay for them, um, and they would be fully paid for over 15 years. So that those investments and those really important programs are not premised on the idea of further deficit reduction. In fact, they're premised on having the adequate revenue to fund the government so the government can partner with the private sector and make these really important investments. And is that a red line? It, it needs to be paid for? So the president has put forth robust plans to, to raise revenue uh, in order to fund these important investments. Philip, that'll be the last one. Um, can I ask kind of a broad approach question? I think a lot of us have been pouring over the, the DLS report last week, trying to divine some type of meaning from things, which I don't <laughs> think is, is easy, particularly in that case. But given your, your expertise in this area, do you feel like it's an indication that normal is just going to be very different right, in, in labor markets whenever there is a full recovery? That people are making different decisions based on the last year. People are, are looking for different kinds of jobs based on the last year. And, and our expectation of what a labor market, the labor market looks like will be very different post-pandemic than it was pre-pandemic. So I try not to read too much in any one month. I think I started with that point. Uh, so I really try. And I think there are many reasons to believe um, and to understand why, why we don't like to do that. For example, if you were drilling down on that report, you know that the reference week was the week of April 12th. That was a week before all adults became eligible for, the, you know, for a vaccination. That was a week before. And then we know it takes five to six weeks for people to become, if they get the Pfizer, Moderna, become fully vaccinated, um, it was also um, it was you know getting into the details. Um, it was I think Easter happened in March this year. Uh, the seasonal adjustments are a little funny within the BLS report. So this is all reasons why we just can't. Oh, and viral loads were were increasing at least in parts of the country in that in that period of time as well. So it's, I think it's really important not to read too much into that one report. If we look over the long, you know, if we look over the last three months or the three months before that, we know that um, employment was rising. Do we expect there may be some sectoral reallocation as a result of the pandemic? Probably. Uh, we probably expect we've accelerated a bit more into uh, remote kinds of uh, employment and, and activities. Uh, but we also know that it's important that we make investments where we address, for example, the existential uh, threat of climate change. We know this country needs to be making those kinds of investments. We know that we need to be making investments in, in infrastructure. 
Uh, we get, seem to be reminded of that almost on a monthly basis, uh, that this country has really great uh, infrastructure needs. So we know that there are a lot of fundamental jobs. If we think about care, a quarter of our, you know, our population is aging, and it's important that we have people who can take care of our, our older people. Um, and have good quality home care workers. So, there, so that we know that there are many jobs which are not going to go away and which are going to be very important as, in order for us to go forward. Just one real quick one. Do you think employers should be considering paying their employees more now as one of the solutions to the 8.1 million open jobs that currently exist? You know, so the way that in our capitalist system, so the way that a market economy works is we work through prices as a signal. And so wages are the price that we work in the labor market. So uh, that would be the natural way for employers to try to attract employees. Uh, again, we're not through this pandemic. Many of those, essential, especially essential workers, those jobs are not uh, risk-free, right? They've become a little more, a uh, little riskier. Um, and so if employers have to pay a little bit more to compensate those employees to take on that risk, I think that's appropriate, again, in a market economy where that's the, that's the currency. So much for quick vote. I promise I won't mention Larry Summers. But on, you mentioned UI, Quite right? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but I just want to understand the White House's position on the enhanced UI. Is it the White House's position that enhanced the payments for unemployment insurance isn't having any effect on the supply side of labor markets? Um, so I will tell you what my I think this is our position is that. Uh, the, you know, the decision to enter the labor market is very complicated right now. That the primary determinants for people to make that decision are, uh, are there is there a suitable job available? Uh, what's the status of the virus? What are the health considerations? And what are the care considerations? Um, the president has emphasized that if a worker is offered a suitable job, they must take it if they're on unemployment insurance benefits. We recognize we're in an unprecedented recession that we have a long way to go, and we want to be in the position of helping employers understand how they can be bringing back employees uh, part-time, which is going to be the suitable way for more employers to bring back more workers. They can't go from zero to 100 just overnight uh, through short-time compensation, reminding employers that there's the employee retention tax credit. Um, and, uh, and so we recognize that right now um, most, most of those who are uh, uh, you know, who are working age are not fully vaccinated. It's going to take time. But workers, as they become fully vaccinated, as the economy starts to open up, we're expecting that they will be looking for suitable jobs and they will be finding them and we will get back to normalcy but, but sooner than later. is or is not a factor for supply side on the labor market? So there are many factors that go into whether a person is taking a job, right? If, if, if somebody is not fully vaccinated, if there's still a lot of COVID in their area, if they have still childcare constraints, there are many factors that this pandemic has caused that are gonna play into people's decision and ability to go back to work. UI has served a very important role through this pandemic. It has allowed people to pay the rent, which we know is very important for the landlord. It's allowed people to put food on the table, which is important for them and their families. And so we stand behind that those are very important supports. There are supports to help us bridge to the end of this pandemic. So um, we believe that it's complicated, but that the labor market will be healing, and we are standing at the ready, and we want to encourage that to happen um, as quickly as safely possible. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. OK. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of items for you at the top, a quick preview uh, of the week ahead. Uh, we have some travel next week. On Tuesday, as we've announced, the president will travel to Dearborn, Michigan, to visit the Ford uh, Rouge Electric Vehicle Center. As Ford has said, this will they will preview for him the new F-150 Lightning, which will be built by UAW workers. On Wednesday, he will travel to New London, Connecticut, where he will deliver the keynote address at the Coast Guard Academy's 140th commencement exercises. And on Friday, he will uh, welcome His Excellency Moon Jae-in, President of the Republic of Korea, to the White House. President Moon's visit will highlight the ironclad alliance between the United States and the Republic of Korea, and the broad and deep ties between our government, people, and economies. Uh, brief update on the Colonial Pipeline. 
uh, with Colonial Pipelines uh, as part of, as the President outlined just yesterday, since the shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline last Friday, we've had a whole of government response uh, across the administration to help get the pipeline back online and mitigate any supply shortages. As a part of that, last night, the Department of Homeland Security announced a second targeted and temporary Jones Act waiver to give us additional tools to get fuel to affected communities. This follows an initial Jones Act waiver Wednesday night, steps that the Department of Transportation took to ease the transport of fuel overlord, over, overlord, overland, overland, and waivers from the EPA that have collectively added the equivalent of five million tanks to the affected region's tank gas supply, in addition to other actions, of course, we've taken across the federal government. With the announcement yesterday uh, that service has been restored to all markets they serve by the by Colonial Pipeline, we know that supply is returning and that the end is in sight. And the actions that DOT and EPA are taking will speed up the process of getting gas from the pipeline to stations, which is, of, of course, of interest, great interest to the American people, especially in the impacted regions. And we want to remind the public that it will take a few days to fully return to normal. We urge people in affected regions to only buy the gas they need uh, so that we can help speed up the process. Our current expectation, based on the conversations between the company and experts at the Department of Energy, is that the vast majority of markets in affected regions are receiving fuel at ga gas stations for consumers and will uh, continue to receive more fuel throughout the weekend and into early next week, hence getting us closer to return us back to normal. With that, Jonathan, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Jen. On infrastructure negotiations, yes. uh, you said yesterday that the only red line term, I know you don't like, uh, for the president was inaction. Previously, the president had pledged that he is not going to raise taxes on the American any Americans who are making less than $400,000 a year. Is that pledge still a red line, or has that changed? That is still a red line. Okay. And would, as a follow-up to that, would raising fees or a raise increase in the gas tax, which is stuff that could be is being discussed in negotiations, uh, would that violate that pledge? Can the administration promise that people making less than four hundred thousand dollars not face an increase in fees? Uh, the president's pledge and his commitment, his line in the sand, his red line, whatever you want to call it, uh, is that he will not raise taxes for people making less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, user fees uh, that have been uh, proposed out there would violate that. Okay. Uh, and then on a second matter on, on Israel, um, the president yesterday said that he had not seen a, quote, significant overreaction in Israel's response. Uh, since then, Israel has increased its rocket strikes and massed troops at the Gaza border. Uh, what, in the president's estimation, would be an overreaction? Um, well, look, let me first say that our objective from this administration, from the president, from our entire national security team, is to work toward de-escalation, to work toward a lasting peace. Uh, and that is what the focus of every conversation uh, we are having from the level of the president on down and many conversations that are happening with people, with leaders in the region, uh, Palestinian leaders, Israeli leaders, uh, Egyptians, Tunisians, many who can be influential on Hamas. Uh, so obviously we are watching this closely. We will remain closely engaged. A lot of conversations we have may happen behind the scenes uh, because that may be the most appropriate way to de-escalate the situation on the ground. Just to follow up to take you down. So what you've seen, so what the president has seen so far from Israel, still he believes is not a significant overreaction. Again, I think the president believes that Israel has a right to self-defense. Uh, obviously, just if we take a step back and remove ourselves for a moment, which I know is hard to do, from the politics, uh, clearly what's happening on the ground, uh, the loss of life, the loss of uh, children's lives, the loss of family, uh, family members' lives, uh, whether it's Palestinian lives or Israeli lives, is incredibly tragic. It's horrific to watch. That is certainly why our focus is on de-escalating what, ha what is happening on the ground. That's, his, that's our human reaction to what we're seeing. What we're also focused on, the President, many people on our team uh, have been uh, working on issues in the Middle East for decades. And what we also know is that sometimes these conversations need to happen privately in order to have an effective outcome. And that's what our focus is on. Go ahead, Trevor. Uh, just to follow up on that uh, point, um, do you feel that Israel is acting with sufficient restraint um, at this point? Again, uh, as the President uh, conveyed in his statement, uh, Israel has the right to self-defense. Uh, our focus uh, remains on uh, continuing to use every lever at our disposal uh, to de-escalate the situation on the ground. I think it's also important to remind people Hamas is a terrorist organization. Uh, Hamas does not represent uh, the uh, views, the families, 
uh, the people who are suffering, uh, all of the Palestinian people who are suffering as a result of this violence. Um, but there's no justification for 1,500 rockets uh, coming from Hamas uh, into Israeli uh, community, is communities in Israel either. Welcome their participation in uh, forthcoming uh, elections, uh, Palestinian elections. Uh, Hamas. Yes. Look, I will say that um, our focus uh, right now is on uh, using our relationships in the region, our deep relationships in the region, again with the Egyptians, the Tunisians, uh, others who have greater influence with Hamas than uh, than certainly we do, and certainly others in the region do, to de-escalate the circumstances and the situation on the ground. That's what our focus is on at this moment in time. Go ahead. Jen, um, what does the CDC's new guidance on masking mean for the president's executive order mandating masks on federal uh, property? Is he going to be rescinding that? Well, again, I think the, the CDC guidelines were just put out, as you all know, yesterday. Um, they were determined by, decided by what they were going to be, what the specifics were, but also the timeline by the CDC, not by us, not by the White House, not by the President, to be very clear. Uh, and we're working to uh, implement those across uh, the government. As you've seen, yesterday, as soon as the guidelines came out, we got a note that came across um, our emails that said, you don't need to wear masks here anymore. We talked to the White House Correspondent Association immediately and said, reporters don't need to wear masks anymore unless they choose to. Same for the American people, of course. So we're working to implement. It may take a couple of days, but certainly I would expect on federal lands, federal properties, that the guidelines will be um, the guide. Got it. Um, Republican senators said that yesterday's infrastructure meeting was productive and it was cordial. So what are the next steps here? What have they agreed to do and by when? And is there a follow-up meeting scheduled at this point? Uh, well, we agree. And I saw the president after the meetings yesterday. And, and you heard him talk about the meetings, of course, uh, when he gave his remarks about the masks. And he agrees. They were constructive. They were productive. Uh, we expect uh, a counterproposal uh, back early next week by Tuesday, is I think what they've committed to as well publicly. Uh, there will be discussions at a staff level, at a member level, from high, uh, from members of the White House team over the coming days, uh, as I think most of you would anticipate. Uh, and then we'll be in touch from there. So I don't have any next meetings to preview for you, but uh, we will be. Um, we we have already been in touch with members. We've already been in touch with their teams. That will continue. Again, we expect the next. Uh, piece to be a counterproposal by Tuesday. And who's running point on this from the White House? Well, it's a, an across the White House effort, Nancy, as you know. Uh, there are a number of officials involved, uh, depending on what the needs are, frankly, from members or staff. So, of course, uh, there are uh, high-level members of the team, everyone from Ron Klain to Steve Reschetti, Louisa Terrell, uh, Rima Doden, who, uh, Chris Levin, I could keep naming names, who have conversations all day long with members on the Hill, with their staffs about what follow-up questions they have, what's next in the process, where there's opportunity for agreement, where there are technical questions. Those are happening all the time. Uh, but you know, ultimately, uh, there will also continue to be conversations at the level of the president and members of the Republican leadership and Republican committee chairs, as well as with Democratic leaders as well. And then can I get your reaction to this report about unaccompanied minors being held in uh, park buses overnight? There was one child reportedly held for four days before being reunited with his family. What's the administration doing now about this case? And when you say that you're going to ensure that those responsible are held accountable, what does accountability look like in this case? Well, first let me say that the reports of children that you've referenced being held in buses outside of HHS uh, of the HHS facility in Dallas for extended periods of time are outrageous, they're unacceptable, and they do not meet our standard for child care. That is true for the President. It is true for the Secretary of Homeland Health and Human Services. It is true for everyone involved across government. Uh, it's being fully investigated how we got to this point, how this possibly happened. Uh, there's no excuse for this kind of treatment in terms of what the consequences will be. I just can't predict that before an investigation is concluded. Go ahead. Thank you. There are a lot of questions about the timing of the CDC's announcement yesterday. So did somebody at the Biden administration or in the Biden administration update this guidance for political reasons? No. So what was the medical or scientific reason? What was the big breakthrough to do this yesterday? 
Well, I know that Dr. Walensky did an extensive number of interviews yesterday to answer exactly that question. But as we've talked in here quite a bit about, the CDC, not just Dr. Walensky, but her entire team of health and medical experts are constantly reviewing the data to ensure that they can provide accurate and up-to-date guidance to the American people. So based on three factors, as she talked about yesterday, Vaccines work in the real world. We've seen a lot of studies done on that, including internally in the federal government. Vaccines stand up to the variants, which at various times has been a concern about uh, the need to continue to masking to mask even as you after you're vaccinated. And vaccinated people are less likely to transmit the virus. That's how they came to the decision. And that's what she conveyed yesterday when she announced the decision. But just looking at the CDC's website on the way up here, only 45.6% of U.S. adults have been fully vaccinated as of yesterday. Only 58.9% of the adult population have, has at least one dose. So what happened to President Biden saying in March that he thought lifting mask mandates before every adult American goes and gets a shot is Neanderthal thinking? Well, first, let me say that the president, our North Star, has been listening to the guidance of our health and medical experts and teams, and that's exactly what we're doing in this case. And just to reiterate, uh, the CDC, the doctors and medical experts there, were the ones who determined what this guidance would be based on their own data and what the timeline would be. That was not a decision directed by, made by the White House. It was informed. The White House was informed of that decision, just to give people assurance of that. So does the president still think that these red state governors who were a little bit ahead of the federal government in lifting the mask mandates had Neanderthal thinking? Well, again, I would say that even with this guidance that's out there, the guidance is not uh, telling uh, states and localities exactly how they should implement. As you know, there are some localities and, gov and uh, states in the country that have higher rates of vaccination than others, some communities that have higher rates of vaccinations than others. And we even know as this is being implemented that different localities, businesses will implement it in the way that they feel will help uh, ensure their community is safe. But I know I am reassured by listening to the health, the guidance of health and medical experts, uh, not political decision making. So that's the point we're at now. And my last one, Andy Slavitt said this morning that the White House found out the mask guidance was going to change at 9 p.m. the night before. Were you guys surprised that in the 9 o'clock hour at 9.25 the CDC director was on CNN saying that the science wasn't there yet? Uh, I didn't watch that interview. I can just tell you that a small number of uh, that they were and we were informed the night before uh, that the guidance that they'd made a decision about the guidance. They plan to announce it the next day. And even here, only a small number of people knew that that announcement was going to be made. Hence, if you were here yesterday, you saw a kind of shock of people taking off their masks around the building. Uh, but you know, it may have been at the point where they were not ready to make the announcement yet. But I, I point you to the CDC on their specific rollout plan. Go ahead. Um, are you guys engaged in any discussions about changing the federal uh, transportation mask mandate at this point? Uh, well, first I would say we're continuing to review, our, our health and medical experts are continuing to review the applicability and what is uh, what is safe to do uh, based on this guidelines, based on their, their new data. Uh, but I don't have anything to preview for you on that front. We'll continue to look to them for guidance on what is safe on an airplane or a train or anything like that. We, you talked a lot about this a couple months ago, but now that we're kind of in a new place, um, is the decision not to pursue a federal vaccine passport policy, is that science-based? Is that you're aware of the political dynamics here? What, what kind of drove the decision behind that, and is there any change to that decision now that we're in a different place? Sure. Um, there's no change to it. Uh, we are not currently considering federal mandates. Uh, we are instead focused on ensuring all Americans understand the benefits of vaccination, uh, that we are answering their questions, and that they have access to get vaccinated. We also understand that private sector companies um, may decide that they want to have requirements. That's up to them to make that determination. If you are running a stadium, if you are a sports team or something like that, you have different considerations. We fully respect that, but we have no plans to change our approach uh, from the federal government. And last one, um, just kind of looking back, it's been a bit of an interesting week <laughs> overall. It has been? A little bit. Um, <laughs> is, there, is there ever concern, and I understand that this is the deal when you're the President of the United States, but you guys have been, spent the first 100 plus days really laser focused on vaccines and economic aid, that things like the reality of being President takes the focus off your agenda at a pretty crucial time legislatively? So the President's view is that this is exactly what he was elected to do. 
uh, is to uh, pre-lead the country uh, during a time of multiple crises. And he came into office, of course, uh, facing both uh, a historic pandemic and 10 million people out of work. He was already facing dual crises when he came in. But his view is that this is what the American people looked, uh, elected him to do. This is why he put together the team he put together to be prepared in these moments. Uh, and this is, uh, and he's, uh, he, the American people elected him to be prepared for whatever comes his way. Go ahead. Um, a quick one to follow on, Phil, first, which I suspect will- On passports? It. No, uh, oh. on the guidelines that are being updated sure. by the CDC, a yeah. uh, question is about cruise ships and whether, when or whether they'll be able to sail. Uh, from U.S. ports, I assume you're going to give a similar answer about how that's still being uh, kind of looked through, but I am curious if you had any update on those. So. I don't have an update. We certainly understand all the interests, and I will say that just like uh, companies and businesses are digesting this, so are we um, in the federal government, and we are even here as it relates to how many staff will be on campus uh, and when, uh, when we can have a full briefing room. We're eager to get back to a version of normal, uh, but we ha we need a little bit of time to implement it and also to uh, to review additional steps. And then a couple on the infrastructure negotiations. I'm, I guess I'm trying to uh, sort of fully understand what the president's strategy is with these negotiations mm -hmm. with Republicans. And it seems like, but I, I guess I'm asking you to sure. if I'm wrong, that he would be willing to go for a smaller, hard infrastructure deal with Republicans and then maybe combine the remainder of it into a deal that he would push through with reconciliation with Democrats on the softer infrastructure stuff that, that you guys have outlined. Is that the, the basic preferred approach of the White House at this point? Uh, I know we like to get ahead of the legislative process, but um, there's a lot that can happen in one day or one week or two weeks, as you all know from covering this for some time. I will say the fundamentals are this. The president remains committed to all the ideas he, put, he has put forward, investing in infrastructure, creating millions of jobs, ensuring that we can do more to uh, support families across the country with childcare, giving additional benefits. He's committed to all those ideas. There are a range of mechanisms for moving them forward. Uh, so yes, we're having a discussion over the last several days that has been primarily focused on uh, different options for hard infrastructure. Uh, and we expect a counter proposal on that early next week. But again, there's a range of ways to move these ideas forward. He's quite open to them. Uh, we're focused on this component at this moment, uh, but we're not going to get too far ahead of where we are in discussions with not just the Republicans, but a range of Democrats as well. And then um, we've seen Obviously, this week, some Republican governors um, pull back expanded unemployment benefits, uh, which is a key priority of the president's in the, in the first mm -hmm. uh, COVID stimulus bill. Uh, we saw with Obamacare also that some Republican um, governors didn't opt into Medicare expansion, so it, it blocked benefit for uh, the, the president. President Obama had saw it in those states. And so I'm wondering if that is at all causing you guys to reconsider elements, especially the family's plan that, you know, things like uh, community college tuition, the free pre-K program are all administered by states. So if there's a worry that um, by essentially giving Republican governors who have been vocal about disagreeing with the president the, the keys to these priorities, uh, you know, whether, if there have been any lessons learned from what we've seen in the last few weeks? Well, first I would say that um, we don't see in the data uh, unemployment benefits as a major driver in uh, a bump, bumpy jobs numbers, as you've heard many people say. So let me start there. Um, second, uh, the, invent the investment in universal pre-K and extended community college uh, we don't see as a partisan proposal. And in fact, if you look across the country, there are some states that you might consider red states that have done things like universal pre-K um, and have been quite successful at it. And these are investments, in our view, that are certainly they have a semi-short-term benefit, uh, but more they have a long-term benefit because kids who attended uh, pre-K as opposed to daycare have more than a 50 percent uh, are more than 50 50 percent more likely to graduate from high school so 
it doesn't change our approach to that, it doesn't change our view that in order to be more competitive over the long term, these are key and vital investments. Uh, and yes, it will need to be a partnership with the states, but we've also seen since then to, to build on the Medicaid expansion, a number of, you know, quote unquote red states have expanded uh, because they see the benefit and they have seen how it has helped states. And, you know, we're hopeful as we work through this and we talk to governors, they can recognize this is not a part of some proposal. It's something that can help the next generation of workers be more competitive. Go ahead. Oh, you, Matt. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, Republicans throughout this negotiating process ha this week have made clear that they're not going to touch the 2017 tax cuts, which is a fundamental way that Biden wants to raise revenue. You've made clear that he's not open to user fees. What other, in trying to understand where the compromise is, mm -hmm. are there any other avenues that the president sees where he would be open to raising revenue? Well, one of the proposals he made was having the IRS play more of a role in ensuring people are paying the taxes they owe. That's one component. But I do expect there may be components and proposals that are put forward that are discussed in these private discussions that may not cross either of those lines. Uh, the bottom line for the president, as we've said, as I said already during this briefing, is that he's not going to raise taxes for people making over $400,000 a year. So that's not a that's not a place where he is going to budge. But he is open to a range of ideas, including ones he didn't propose. Is that something he's expecting them to come back with on Tuesday, is some sort of way to raise revenue that you can begin that discussion? Because it seems like most of the discussions have been absent of revenue raisers. It's we, we certainly expect that that will continue to be a part of the discussion. But what I think is important to remember here from our vantage point is that the good, the positive sign is that there is agreement in the need to invest in infrastructure and modernize our infrastructure. What we were talking about, about is how to pay for it. That's an important component and a part of the discussions. But, you know, the agreement on investing in infrastructure across uh, Democratic and Republican leaders and the President of the United States is certainly a significant uh, positive development. Uh, quickly, yeah. just on, on Israel, um, President Obama in 2012 sent uh, Hillary Clinton to broker a ceasefire in Gaza. Is there any discussion in this White House of sending Tony Blinken this time around to negotiate a ceasefire in Gaza? Well, let me say that at this point in time, uh, what we have, the step we've taken is we have uh, a um, envoy, a deputy assistant secretary from the State Department who is over there playing a role engaging uh, in, uh, in working toward a, a lasting peace. Uh, we also have a great deal of trust in our uh, team that is on the ground, uh, led by career employee of career, career staff who have a great deal of experience in the region. And obviously we'll continue to evaluate what's need and how we can what's needed and how we can play a constructive role. But what I can tell you is that our engagement is extensive, it is deep and it will continue. Uh, behind the scenes, and that includes with Israelis and Palestinians. It also includes key leaders in the region who we think can play a constructive role in bringing us uh, to a more uh, peaceful outcome. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Um, what message is the president uh, trying to send by having DACA recipients come, uh, come here? And you have all these priorities. You obviously have the jobs and, and infrastructure. Um, you have, uh, he's He's put kind of a timeline down for the uh, police reform bill. Um, where does immigration rank in terms of what is the timeline he sees for getting that done? Well, first, I think um, the president believes that um, DACA recipients are part of the American story and part of the fabric of who we are as a country and kind of what the American dream represents. So bringing them here is an opportunity to highlight that. And there has historically been agreement about the, in, the uh, powerful stories of DACA recipients, of uh, the incredible contributions they have the potential to make in our country from Democrats and Republicans. He's certainly bringing them here to highlight that. And as he said in his joint session address, he believes there's an opportunity to move forward on areas where we agree. So let's find areas where we agree on immigration reform. Uh, I will say it remains, he put forward a immigration bill, as you know, on his first day in office. Uh, he continues to advocate for that. He talked about it in his joint session speech, uh, and he'll continue to have conversations and have his senior staff have conversations about how we can move that or components of that forward. Um, and we've, that's oh. a very jarring <laughs> phone ringing. Um, obviously, you've seen this uh, leadership perch in the House. I'm curious, has the president spoken with uh, former Vice President Cheney? Uh, 
I'm not aware of any call with former Vice President Cheney, no. Go ahead. Uh, yes, does uh, the White House think it's going to help convince unvaccinated people to get their shots when they hear that it's safe for the vaccinated to remove their masks? And can that be part of the sales pitch going forward to get vaccinated? Well, it's an interesting question, but I think one thing that's just very important to make clear is that the CDC, who doesn't has no role in determining how to get more people vaccinated um, or operationally, right, made this determination based on data and the advice of health and medical experts. Um, if you move beyond that, uh, it is now, now that that guidance is out there, it is important for people to understand the benefits of being vaccinated. Uh, and they can obviously make a choice if they will wear a mask or not. We're going to operate with kindness, as the president said yesterday, but uh, it is something we will continue to talk about and continue to remind people that if they go get vaccinated, if they get those two vaccines, they may feel like it's a pain in the neck, but there are benefits and we'll keep talking about that absolutely. Going back to unemployment insurance, uh, a growing number of Republican governors, I think 16 at this point, have been opting out of the federal subsidies to unemployment insurance. What's uh, the White House's position on that? Do they discourage more states from doing that? Well, I would say that we certainly understand that governors and leaders are going to have to make a choice, um, make a decision uh, in regard to unemployment benefits. But what's important to remember and what we remind people of is that, again, we don't see this as a major driver in uh, preventing people from seeking employment and seeking work. And actually what we see in the data to date is that the pandemic uh, not being vaccinated, that there's been a, a massive increase over the last month in the number of people who, who were vaccinated in comparison with a month ago when the data was taken. Uh, fears of, uh, of, of not being safe, uh, sometimes childcare, uh, and also uh, the need to uh, be paid a, a livable uh, wage are all factors that are contributing. And what we would also suggest, and I know someone asked this earlier, but is that um, many of these companies, big companies, let me say, who benefited, uh, many of them made quite a profit during the pandemic, and many of them also received quite a bit of benefits, $1.4 trillion worth, could pay, could offer to pay a little bit more, and maybe that will incentivize more workers to come back into the workforce. And I have a question from Voice of America. Can you uh, confirm plans for a virtual White House aid celebration announced by the Council on American Islamic Relations to be held on May 16th? And will the president or vice president be there? And can you give any details or a message to Muslims on the celebration? I know there are plans in the works. Um, I expect we'll have more details on that out. So let me venture to get that out after the briefing. Uh, go ahead in the back. Um, with the new CDC guidance, will the president have um, uh, uh, switched to, to in-person rallies on a big scale? And uh, are there any more press conferences planned? Uh, well, look, I think we're still figuring out how to implement it um, and uh, how it will impact um, how we go about our uh, daily uh, work at the White House. And so far, uh, we don't wear masks in meetings. We're all vaccinated. We don't wear masks in meetings with the president. That has immediately certainly changed. But in terms of what it will mean for travel and the size of events, we're not quite there yet. And just on the change in Republican House leadership uh, summit, Concerns have been expressed that uh, this party has become anti-democratic, that uh, in particular, if Republicans win back the House next year, as historical trends suggest they've got a great chance, that they would refuse to certify the results of a 2024 presidential election win if it was a, a Democrat. How, how worried is the president about that? Is it something he would talk to Republican leaders about? I will tell you the president has not spent much time worrying about the outcome of midterm elections that are a year and a half away. Um, but what his focus is on is continuing to do the work of the American people, uh, get the pandemic under control, put people back to work, look for opportunities of common ground uh, to work even with Republicans to get that done. And while uh, the Republican Party uh, may be having uh, a bit of a um, identity crisis right now about who they are and what they stand for, He's very clear about who he is, what he stands for, and what he's going to do as president. Go ahead. Coming back to the Middle East, it's getting more and more lost because what's going on in Gaza. But everything started in Jerusalem. What is President Biden's position on East Jerusalem? Is East Jerusalem on the table when the administration is speaking about viable two-state solution? Well, that is uh, an issue that has long been and will always be uh, for discussion between two parties in a Dis uh, in a, a negotiation about the path forward. So I don't have an additional position on it. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Jen. I have a question about USAID to Israel and to Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, first, 
1,500 rockets from Gaza going toward Israel. The Iron Dome has taken down many, many rockets. That's cost a lot of munitions. Is the U.S. going to help Israel replenish the Iron Dome? Well, uh, I don't have anything to preview in terms of additional assistance. I will say that uh, we have an important uh, relationship, partnership, strategic security relationship with Israel. Uh, as you know, we have uh, provided a range of support over the last several years and even decades, uh, including the Iron Dome, uh, but I don't have anything to preview in terms of additional support. But you won't commit to replenishing the Iron Dome? I don't have anything to preview for you in terms of additional support. We've long been a supporter, uh, both in terms of uh, our partnership, but also our uh, security assistance that we have provided to Israel. That's been consistent. Nothing has changed in regard to that approach, and I don't expect it would moving forward. On April 7th, the State Department uh, announced that it had unlocked $75 million in economic assistance to the West Bank and Gaza. Mm -hmm. Is that being reviewed in light of the rocket attacks coming from Gaza to Israel? No, that was humanitarian assistance the, to the Palestinian people. Again. Uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization. The Palestinian people are also suffering as a result of the actions of this terrorist organization and the steps, that they, the rockets that they have launched into Israel. Uh, so, no, the humanitarian assistance will, of course, continue. What specific steps has President Biden taken to help de-escalate the conflict? Well, I went through this a little bit the other day, but let me, let me go through some of it. Um, first, as you know, the President obviously has had his own conversations. Um, a conversation with Prime Minister Netanyahu. We've had dozens of high-level calls and meetings with senior U.S. officials and with senior officials from Israel, the Palestinian Authority, our Arab, Arab partners and other stakeholders. Our national security uh, advisor has spoken with his counterpart in Israel multiple times. We've had regular dialogue multiple times per day with Egyptian and Qatari officials. So we have been incredibly engaged at the highest level here uh, from the federal government. As you know, uh, sometimes those conversations uh, need to take place uh, privately. Um, and we, of course, want to convey who we're talking to and what we're, the messages we're conveying, but we're not going to read out every single conversation either. Is President Biden just trying to stay out of it? I think that what I just outlined makes clear that he's asked his team to not only keep him updated and abreast of what's happening on the ground, but to be deeply engaged with the Israelis, the Palestinians, uh, and also with leaders and partners in the region to work toward a more lasting peace. When he said this week that he was going to be closing down sooner rather than later, what was the indication from his conversations with, with Netanyahu? Well, that was certainly our hope. And obviously, uh, what happened, I think, earlier this week is that assurances from Hamas that they were prepared to stand down proved to be false. And we certainly understand that that can happen in these conflicts, but we still need to stay at it and remain engaged with all of the parties in the region. Uh, go ahead in the back. Yeah, two questions for you. One, a couple of days ago, we saw the release of this year's Religious Freedom Report. And Secretary Blinken said that religious freedom is no more or no less important than any other human right. Why should the faith community not see that as a de-emphasis when the previous administration made religious freedom a top priority? Well, I think it's just how you look at what human rights are. Uh, I think what the secretary, and I certainly send you the State Department, but uh, religious freedom, what he was saying is it's incredibly important around the world and we're going to work to protect that. And I think our U.S. policies convey that. But as is the freedom of speech, uh, the freedom of expression, uh, and you know the, that the role of the State Department when they put out this report is, and any report is certainly to convey what our values are from the United States and what we're going to convey as we engage diplomatically around the world. And what do you say to those who are criticizing the president and vice president who have not to date made an in-person visit to the Southwest border? Who are those? Who are those? Those who have criticized. There have like been, who? There have been lots of people criticizing the fact that they've not made a, a trip to the border yet. Like who? Criticism from those in the Republican Party, criticism from others. Well, I don't know who I'm responding to, uh, but what I will say is that the president's focus uh, and the- Just the other day, um, one of the senators held a press conference where that was a major criticism. The fact one of the senators, okay. Well, the president, Scott, Senator, Scott. Senator Rick Scott, okay. Well, the president's focus and the vice president's focus is on solutions. And what, our, uh, what we've seen over the past several months uh, is that while well, we came in and there were, was little preparation for uh, what was going to be a surge of migrants at the border, what we've done since then is 
uh, rapid or is massively reduced the number of uh, children who are at border patrol facilities from over 5,000 to under 1,000. The prob number's probably even lower than that now, and massively reduced the number of hours that these children are spending in these facilities. So our focus is on working in, through the interagency process, pressing to eliminate bureaucracy, and making sure that we're taking steps that treat them in a humane and moral uh, way, and we're less worried about press conferences or political games that are being played by some. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting. Okay, hello. Um, well, we have a special guest, as we like to do on Fridays. Um, so, Mayan Schechter, nice to meet you. That's a beautiful name from the state. Um, how can we help you? Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, in South Carolina, we're looking at another incident of an unarmed black man dying while in police custody. This time, a man named Jamal Sutherland, who had reported mental health issues and who died in a Charleston County jail earlier this year uh, after he was repeatedly tased by corrections officers. A video became public last night. For many in South Carolina, it's underscoring the need for police uh, reform, uh, even for those who work inside jails and prisons, especially when dealing with people who have mental, mental illnesses. How engaged has the president been in those police reform talks, and when does he hope to see a final package come to fruition? Well, thank you for your question. Let, let me first say that um, we, uh, of course, have closely watched and are very aware of the case that you're referring to in South Carolina. I know it's been a dominant issue over the last several days or longer there. Uh, I can't speak to the specifics of it, given there's an investigation. But what I can say is that uh, the president's focus uh, and belief is that police reform is long overdue, uh, that far too often um, communities of color are living in fear uh, and are exhausted by the threat uh, and the possibility of, uh, of being in harm's way. And they should not feel that way. Um, he has set a timeline that he would like to see uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act uh, pass by May 25th, which is also the anniversary of his death. Uh, the negotiations and discussions are happening now uh, with one of your home state uh, me members, Senator Tim Scott, along with Senator Cory Booker uh, and uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass. Uh, they're having discussions. Those are ongoing, and he is hopeful and looking forward to having a bill uh, to his desk so he can sign it into law. But we are very engaged with them uh, and keep abreast of the discussions, um, but we are leaving it to them to have a lot of the negotiations among themselves, uh, among members. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us in the briefing room today. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.